Thank you very much for coming. Uh, the purpose of this conference is to talk about the convergence of intellectual property, value creation, and investing. Um, it's a story that uh, is now at an important inflection point. And I think that many people uh, understand it anecdotally, but don't appreciate that intellectual property investing around IP is really a comprehensive opportunity set. Uh, so first, let's talk a little bit about how we got here, and then we'll talk about where we are and sort of define the taxonomy of comprehensive IP investing. This is a slide that shows on the orange line and the graph on the top, returns of the S&P 500 beginning in 1998. Uh, the, excuse me, the white line is the S&P 500 since 1998. The orange line is average hedge fund returns over the same period of time. So some of the history of hedge fund investing from a Wall Street perspective. This graph begins in 1998. I started as a hedge fund manager two years before that in 1996. But basically, uh, due to the limitations of Bloomberg data, we can't go back to 96, but assume that 96 and 97 track along the same rates as what you're seeing beginning in 98. And what you see on the orange line is the rise of tech stocks, the tech boom, and the ability to invest long and dumb. All you had to do was buy the market, and you did incredibly well. But something was going on in the background between, say, 96 and 2000. And what that was, was hedge funds were beginning to gain critical mass. And traditional hedge fund strategies like merger arbitrage, convertible bond arbitrage, volatility arbitrage, long short trading, were all doing very, very well. They weren't performing at the same rate of the market, but they were strongly positive. And the notion in alternative investing began to arise that there was this thing called downside risk. And you might want to be able to short stocks or take uncorrelated investment uh, positions so that you didn't experience exactly what happened in 2002. And that's where you see the tech bubble and the dramatic decline in the broad market. And you can see for the first time, hedge funds started to outperform the broad market. That's where the graph goes from red that shows the overperformance of the broad market to green where it shows the overperformance of hedge funds. And then we got over the tech bubble and hedge funds continued to do well. And sure enough, the market started to outperform hedge funds again. And everybody kind of lost the theme of diversified, uncorrelated investing again. But then what happens, we get to 2008 and there's a severe market break. Everybody remembers it. Everybody, many people lost their houses, many people lost their fortunes. And what happened? For the second time over that time period, again, in the short window between 08 and 09, hedge funds, market neutral strategies, uncorrelated, dispersed, non-long only strategies began to outperform again. But look at this. This is very, very critical. If you look at the absolute low of the market in the beginning of 09, and you'd bought the stock market there, you see a movement, a relative movement of 676 on the index to 1573. Virtually a 250% return in the long only market. At the same time, hedge funds went sideways. They basically didn't make much of a return at all, resulting in a profile that looks like this. This is 2013 year to date. What you see under the curve is the distribution of hedge fund performance. And you see the average hedge fund returning 5.4%. If you look at the right, though, you can see the S&P 500, if you exclude the last uh, week of trading days, up 15.4%. The average mutual fund up 14.8%. So why are people paying 2 and 20 fees for 5.4% return when they could buy the broad market, pay less than 100 basis points, and create three times the performance. Well, if we go back for a second and look at this graph, what do we see? We see the tremendous ramping of the broad market. And we know, what did Federal Reserve Chairman Bernanke say last week? He was going to end tapering. So 
everybody who's made a ton of money being long is now exposed to downside risk. You cannot be long and go away for the summer anymore and expect to make money. We're going to enter turbulent times again. So this will be a return to times of dispersion, non-correlation, and not taking market beta. So how do, we, how do we deal with this? Well, what we all know from our experience in IP, and everybody I think has seen the Ocean Tomo inversion graph, as we call it, that shows how if you look back in 1975, you saw that um, only 25% of the market cap of the S&P 500 was intangible assets, and you look at the same graph today, and it's over 80%. We know that we're an innovation economy. We know that we no longer manufacture significantly in this country. We know that everything that's going on is being driven by innovation. So the two themes that got us here today is the rise of intellectual property and demand to finance it, monetize it, and seek uncorrelated returns from it, while the market, witnessing the tapering is going to end and can no longer get the free ride of quantitative easing, has to find a way to invest intelligently without taking market beta. So what is that? Well, we believe what it is is a comprehensive end-to-end -end intellectual property investing program. And if you look at the agenda of this conference, what we try and do is make discrete presentations, discrete panels about each of the themes in IP investing. Now, it's very interesting to me, and again, I come from the perspective of being a special situations investor. And as a special situations investor, what you do first is you find the trade. You find the edge. You look for the best risk-adjusted return, and then you try and look for the way in the capital structure that's the most intelligent way to exploit it. So in my own experience, I do everything from very liquid investing to special situations to illiquid investing. And what I've seen in the last seven years of being involved in intellectual property is that there's IP alpha everywhere. What we see, though, is that IP alpha is pretty much exploited narrowly by the investing community. There's guys that do IP rights enforcement investing, there's some IP collateralized debt. There's some activism. There's some idiosyncratic um, IP-based distressed investing. But nobody's looking at IP investing as a whole spectrum of comprehensive themes. But that's what we're going to explore at this conference. So just going through this taxonomy for a second, on the liquid side, I'm not aware of anybody that systematically invests in intellectual property equities. Now, there's two types of equities. And if you look, come to my office and look at my screen of stocks I follow, there's about 60 to 70 stocks that are IP rich and are driven exclusively by IP themes. And then there's probably 400 other stocks that have deep embedded IP catalysts in them. You can trade these stocks long short and what's very, very interesting is that IP stocks have no correlate, very low correlation to the broad market, much greater volatility, and much greater dispersion. So if you understand IP rich companies and IP poor companies and can trade them relative value, you can create a portfolio that eliminates the long only beta risk that is in the market today but still gives you liquid opportunities to invest in the market, create those returns without the downside exposure. And what's very fascinating about long short investing, what we're going to explore on the panel, is that not only can you do intra-sector long short trades to eliminate that risk, but you can also do capital structure trades. Many IP rich companies not only have public equity, but have tradable liquid debt, creating capital structure opportunities. In special situation space, we think about five types of investments. Activism, distressed, change of control, patent arbitrage, and IP litigation outcomes. Now, all of, we, we, we will have an activism panel. We will have a distressed panel. We won't talk about um, litigation outcome investing, but what I think is really critical to realize about that from an investor's perspective is intellectual property volatility is always mispriced. It's always too cheap. So you don't have to, as an investor, make directional bets on IP litigation outcome. You can buy puts, buy calls, buy volatility cheap, 
And inevitably, when those verdicts come, you're in the money on your options because IP stocks move more than is anticipated by the market's view of volatility. On the illiquid side, we're going to talk about IP collateralized debt. And as many of you know, uh, it's been done for um, late stage VC companies, for SMEs, and we've got panelists who will talk about private, relatively smaller IP collateralized lending. But at the same time, we are bringing a gentleman who was part of the underwriting team for the Alcatel Lucent 5 billion euro uh, liquid three tranche debt offering that came in January that was secured importantly by an IP portfolio valued at $5 billion. Um, all of us have little things that get us jazzed and get us out of bed in the morning. One of the things that I enjoy most on my morning is turning on my Bloomberg, looking at the Goldman debt runs and seeing Alcatel Lucent debt based on intellectual property trading liquidly every day. That's a watershed event. If a company can borrow two and a half billion euros based on the valuation of their IP portfolio, have it underwritten by Goldman and Credit Suisse and have it trade liquidly every day. We're truly getting an inflection point. We'll then move on to IP rights enforcement investing. Um, um, I think that if you were to speak to the average Wall Streeter about what IP investing is, he thinks it's just that. Um, we will have a series of debates about um, what is an NPE, whether it's good or bad, how it's done, how it's funded. And then finally, uh, just to stake out the last end of, or the, or the opposite end of the goalpost from completely liquid trading through completely illiquid trading, we're seeing the rise of either IP driven or IP importantly influenced private equity transactions. Masaid was taken private in December of 11. Masaid, as you all know, or at least the IP people here know, the investment people might not, uh, Masaid is a licensing and enforcement company. What was important about that deal is that when we financed that deal, the senior debt, as you would expect, was financed by the cash flows that came from an existing license program. The mezzanine debt, the subordinated debt, was financed based on a prospective licensing program that wasn't then yet generating cash flows. Those types of innovations in financing are critical to the development of our market. Um, I don't know uh, if people realize there's a number of very important IP-driven leverage buyouts um, in the market today. Just one anecdote, and I think that what's important about this anecdote is to acknowledge that while we here today are on the leading edge and to some extent speaking to each other because not enough people understand where we are, um, a very large top five global private equity firm, one of the smartest guys on the street, was making a bid for life technologies. We have a very close relationship to them, and so I called the head of private equity there and I said, do you realize that you're bidding for a company that has 5,000 patents, and if you read its 10K, over 50% of its revenue is generated from an in-licensing program, and a majority of the rest of its income is generated through selling uh, genomics machines that are patent protected. Have you done an analysis before you make this $12 billion offer of the IP in this firm? And they said, uh, well, no, we haven't. Uh, perhaps we should retain you. And so they did retain us, and we got into the data room. And the first thing that we noticed, and we were late to this trade, so financial buyers have been through, industry buyers have been through, $12 billion transaction, 5,000 patents, there was not even a complete list of all of the IP possessed by this company in the data room. So there is a very long way to go in bringing together the street and intellectual property and the ability to fully exploit alpha across the range of investment types that exist. But that's why we, or at least I believe, are on the cusp of this new converged golden age of investing and IP value creation. And I think it will inure to the benefits of everybody in this room being first movers. And I encourage everybody to stay for as much of this conference as possible and learn about IP investing outside of the single box or single vertical in which you participate. 
because if I have one message, it's there's alpha everywhere and we need to be exploiting it. Thank you.